right. I'm thrilled to have the opportunity to introduce uh, Dina Engel from uh, NYU. Dina is a clinical professor in the Department of Computer Science at the Courant Institute of Mathematical Sciences of New York University, as well as the director of the program in Digital Humanities and Social Science. She teaches undergraduate computer science courses on web and database technologies, as well as courses for undergraduates and graduate students in digital humanities. She also supervises undergraduate and graduate st students, uh, their research projects in the digital humanities and the arts, and collaborates on research in the conservation of software-based art and collection management systems in contemporary art. Dina's title today is The Fragility of Software-Based Art, an Approach to Developing Strategies for Conservation and Treatment. Please join me in welcoming Dina. Good afternoon. So the work that I am about to describe is the result of collaboration with Joanna Phillips, who is now the director of conservation, the Conservation Center in Dusseldorf, Germany. This talk is based on work that we did together at the Solomon R. Guggenheim Museum here in New York City. So what is time-based media art? Well, that's outside the scope of today. There are many categories and many ways to look at it. For this talk, I will focus on computer-based art and specifically software art, where software is the medium. As, Jim, as Martin Wattenberg said in a 2002 interview, software is the best way that I have found to express myself. When I work in other media, the results somehow always seem worse in reality than in my head. The software that I create, however, has a magical quality. It ends up being better than what I originally planned and imagined. To put it more metaphorically, when I create art, I feel like I am in con conversation with the artwork. In order to discuss software-based art today, I will focus on two case studies of restorations that we have completed at the Guggenheim Museum. I will use these case studies to examine details in conservation practice and treatment and look at where we can generalize from these case studies to other areas of software-based art. Brandon, Sorry about that. Oh, well. Um, if you could go ahead and do that for me, thank you. So Brandon by Shuli Chang is based on the tragic story of trans man Brandon Tina and is a sprawling interactive web piece with dozens of pages and pop-up windows and several thousand files. The work is 20 years old and some of its technologies, especially the Java applets, are no longer supported by contemporary browsers and have required invasement, invasive treatment of the code. Unfolding Object is also, by John F. Simon Jr., is also an early web artwork, about 16 years old, and allows users to unfold the quote-unquote object to create their own artwork online. The lines that you see indicate previous engagement of other users with the same unfolding pages. This work, too, needed conservation intervention due to its Java applet that is no longer supported by modern browsers. Web-based artworks pose special challenges due to the ever-changing nature of the World Wide Web. In both of these cases, we settled on migration rather than emulation 
as appropriate treatment. So let's start with the discussion of documentation. Before work can begin on computer or software-based art, or on any software application for that matter, it could be an ATM machine, extensive documentation is needed to support the remediation, the software term, or treatment, and is a standard practice in professional software development and maintenance. In the case of software-based artworks, documentation serves many purposes for the computer programmers, for the conservators, for art historians and curators, because we learn so much about the artist's practice, the artist's intent. Sometimes we learn about earlier attempts that would be like analogous to a sketch beneath a painting, and much more that is of interest for the curator and art historians working with us. So, Based on some comments earlier, I would say that with software-based art, I'm not sure there's such a thing as too much documentation. Um, because while systems documentation is a standard practice in professional software development, as I mentioned, I would argue that for works of art, more documentation is required in order to best support the many ways that it's used. Writing comments into the source code, for example, allows us to annotate the code for human readers without altering the way that the code runs, as the computer ignores these comments when the program is compiled or a script is running. For both of the projects that I described today, my computer science students who worked with me and Joanna did extensive source code analysis on, a newly, on newly copied program files for this purpose as part of the documentation. In some cases, charts are the clearest way to convey information instrumental to the programmers, conservators, or cura and or curators' understanding of the work. Since Brandon consists of over 3,000 files and over 20 different file types, we found very early on that by programmatically creating a directory tree, a file was generated for the whole project that everyone could annotate and this became a map during study. We further used programming to build scripts to help us with analysis of the file tree, looking at the file types, the file locations, um, by writing a script that would traverse the directories, build the statistics, summarize the files and the file types in a number of different ways, and automatically generate charts from this output. So for example, at one point in the project, a question came up about GIF images, animated GIF images versus still images. So traversing 3,000 files by hand would be difficult enough to look for the GIFs, but we wouldn't, you wouldn't know manually whether an animated GIF is animated, except by opening it. However, with an additional two or three lines of code to the script we already had, we had the answer for that particular curator in minutes. We have found that screen recordings of walkthroughs of these works of art, either by the artist or the researchers, allow future conservators and others to see how the artwork functioned and to study the behaviors after the work is no longer functioning. Both of the Guggenheim Museum blog posts, which we published when the restored versions of branding and unfolding object were launched, contain a video of a walkthrough. In the case of Brandon, our programmer, Emma Dixon, did the walkthrough and the artist, John F. Simon Jr., did the walkthrough for the newly restored unfolding object. These are both on the Guggenheim website. The students, conservators, and curators participated in artist interviews, which were recorded and became part of the documentation for these works, both before treatment began and then once or twice, as needed, during treatment. Hardware assessment was not needed in these two cases, as they are web-based, but should be considered for other works of software art. So I am often asked, what is the value of the software documentation from a conservation and art historical perspective? What do we actually learn? Reading the source code is like following a musical score. And to reference something again from this morning, the source code is not ambiguous. So for example, source code can tell us the precise colors in a work as measured 
possibly in hex triplets or RGB values, in HSB, hue saturation brightness values, or another computational format that will allow future conservators to understand the artist's intent regarding color. Randomization in the behavior of an artwork generally, in my experience, cannot be accurately determined by simply viewing. In the case of Brandon, the we did not understand the randomization, also true in unfolding object, until we looked at the source code. Other things that we learn from the document, from the source code, which um, contribute to the documentation is determining the speed of animations or how to calculate those speeds, the role and use of any user input. This was particularly important in both of these works and how the images and sound files are managed, how media are managed. It's not always clear without the source code to understand whether images are dynamically, program, meaning programmatically drawn, or are they stored as GIF or PNG files, for example, and the same would be true for sound files. But from a conservation perspective and a software engineering perspective, source code analysis also helps to highlight and perform realistic risk assessments on these works. For example, are there software drivers for specialized hardware? Are there external libraries required? For example, the so-called physics libraries, which are libraries of code that one can use, for example, to simulate a hair blowing in the wind or the effect on shape of a bouncing object. How are external data sources managed and where the data are stored, if that's part of the artwork? And uh, not last, but not last, but not least, but among other things to consider is how the work interacts with its operating system. So from a programmer's perspective, the questions come up, and one is, how does conservation documentation and how do the treatment of a work of software-based art differ from standard software remediation in other fields, like the proverbial ATM machine? In our research, Joanna and I looked at the application, for example, of, the conser of conservation ethics to um, practice using the AIC guidelines. That's one area of difference. Um, we also gave thought to informed choice of methods along these lines. For example, in our brand and restoration, you see on top there is a broken Java applet that no longer runs, which we replaced with GIF images and JavaScript. Um, not only, well, we chose the GIF images and JavaScript not only because they are supported by modern browsers and we believe they will be around for a long time, but also because these technologies are already found in other areas of Brandon and therefore we believe are consistent with and reflect artistic decisions that were made when the work was created. We also found that CSS, cascading style sheets, that that technology was available, we know it was available at the time that Brandon was created, but it was not used. So we therefore made a decision not to implement CSS in the restoration, both because of our technical concerns and out of respect for the original. We addressed the conservation concept of compensation for loss a number of ways, one of them by commenting out code that we no longer needed. We deactivated the code, in this case, by adding these particular tags. Commenting out code happens differently in different programming environments, so that these lines would be ignored, but they remain extant in the source code, so this intervention is fully reversible. When we added new code to compensate for loss, we bracketed it with annotations such as new code start or new code end, which are ignored during processing, but again, provide documentation that this is new code which constitutes a conservation intervention or software remediation. We used consistent annotations for all code interventions so that we could programmatically and easily find all of the instances of change to the code. So 
here you see code, you see text that is blinking. This is a scene from Brandon. So that code no longer ran. Here in this example, you see that the words answer yes or no should be blinking. But rather than modify the artist's original code in this example and in many others, we built out JavaScript functions external to the artist code, but that would then mimic the behaviors. So in this case, the Java function, this JavaScript function, excuse me, there's a big difference between Java and JavaScript. The JavaScript function is actually looking for blink tags and will reanimate them. This again is fully reversible. But what is it that we actually are trying to conserve? We found that it's the algorithms in the source code that continually drew our attention, that the artist used to create his or her artwork. Technically, an algorithm is a set of steps that can be formally defined and thus repeated with the same results. In the history of mathematics, algorithms date back to the ancient Greeks, like the sieve of Aristophanes and others, um, and writing and studying algorithms is one of the many creative processes in mathematics and in computer science. So the same can be said for the arts. We can view the algorithms as evidence of the artist's creative practice as an original artistic expression that he or she applies to produce the design and the audiovisual effects of an artwork. We can understand this in thinking about how artists use programming languages to express their algorithms to create their artworks. Here we have the opening page of the opening of unfolding objects seen on the left, for example, handled by the algorithm excerpted on the right in Java. In this example, the artist is setting up the rules for the opening page. Specifically, the opening color of the object is determined through a calculation that first checks the hour of the day to determine a color that is measured as hue, and then uses another calculation or algorithm to devise a near but not exact opposite or complementary color for the background. Both of these colors are then rendered into RGB just before display. In fact, there is a whole art genre, so-called algorithmic art, a subset of generative art that is centered around the concept of algorithms. John F. Simon Jr. is one of the artists who has explored this notion of rule-based art with a number of his artworks, and we've heard a great deal about the current exhibition at the Whitney that, if you haven't seen it, I would run. Um, you can see here the visual repetition as well as the transformation and changes in the lines and drawing. Like Brandon, Unfolding Object makes use of now the now unsupported Java applet technology, so code intervention was determined necessary to restore its online accessibility. Unfolding objects, visual design, its colors, its color gradation, the shapes of its pages, and the way that the pages unfold are all based on algorithms created by the artist, and it's these algorithms we wish to conserve. So coming back to unfolding object, when we migrated JavaScript, we kept the original code intact as much as possible, again, by using external functions in the JavaScript, so that in this case, for example, we wanted to make the floating point numbers, which are numbers with decimal places, behave in JavaScript as they behaved in Java. The term that Joanna and I came up with to describe this process is code resituation. This is an interdisciplinary approach using digital, in this case, programming methods to remediate software, of course, but in a collaborative setting so that the art historical significance of the code and the artist hand is conserved. So given the significance that we identified for the artist-created algorithms, 
the questions guiding our treatment planning surrounded how do we preserve the algorithms even if we have to migrate parts of the code, parts of the code from the original, in this case from Java into JavaScript. It was our treatment goal to recreate the identical behaviors, in this case using a browser-supported language while retaining the original algorithms. So while all of this may seem logical to conservators, this is not a typical approach in the programming and software world. Programmers would be inclined to delete the old defunct code entirely and recreate the behaviors, very possibly with their own new algorithms and certainly in a very different environment. And I had one student who was very concerned that he was going to get a low grade by doing it this way. I had to reassure him that this is an art project. So we need to take into account also the differences in how programming languages are used. One difference, for example, to consider when migrating code from one programming language to another is to consider the availability of specific programming tools. For example, you can see that the diagonal lines on the left are blurry, but they are staggered on the right. This is due to the different programming tools and code li libraries underlying the two languages and how they render graphics. The original Java rendered staggered lines, but native JavaScript default library renders them blurry. In cases like this, additional adjustments might be needed. And in this particular case, these are completely outside of the artist created code because the artist didn't have to worry about this particular aspect. Throughout both treatments, we use the version control tool GitHub to document and track every step of our work. Date and author stamps are automatically issued, and GitHub also offers clear methodologies so that original code can be, cared, can be compared to restoration code for any given change. This supplemented the work we were already doing using scripting and programming to compare code, to look at files, and many other, in many other ways. So in conclusion, what are the treatment parameters that we have found important to consider in the conservation and treatment of software-based art? Given that this is such a different approach from standard software remediation, even though the practical goal remains that the software needs to run properly and meet systems requirements, how does one evaluate these decisions? First, um, to think about is emulation an option? In the, as I mentioned, in this case, it was not. We net, one would next consider, is there a newer version of the same programming language or programming environment available? If not, is there another programming language that is similar enough in syntax and in structure that we could use to allow for as much code resituation as possible? One would also consider whether there are analogous functions, libraries, or other code sources to support the restoration. How does the environment need to be configured? And can the configuration be used to support either the migration or the emulation? And finally, will the language, if we're migrating, will that language selection still support all of the required systems and functional requirements, meaning from a practical point of view, will the program actually run? We have found that this approach helps us to streamline our work and to build a decision-making framework that observes principles and guidelines, as well as best practices in both conservation and in programming and software engineering. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tina. Sure. Are there any questions from the audience? You talked a little bit about emulation, you considered yeah. that, and then your uh, interventions. Did you consider uh, using an archive of the same software on period hardware? Um, well, this is web-based. No, right, but taking, taking existing frameworks that ran at the time that the piece was created, 
on hardware from that time so that you have a system that behaves in the same way because it is an archive of that. I I could see that could if so first of all I think working with very old hardware has a lot of problems in itself. So if that's what you mean. Um, I'm very concerned. I think um, in this case our bigger concern was the internet environment and um, that one should be able to just simply go online and both artists, um, well, I, I should say a number of web-based artists whom we have met with um, have talked about internet as kind of the public art. Uh, one of the artists that we interviewed talked about the, that black square on Astor Place as public art and as internet as public art. So um, to put it on anything that would have to sit in a gallery um, would not meet the what the artists um, considered to be the reach of their works, I believe. Yeah. Um, really nerdy question, I think. Sure. But, I um, love those. Are you kidding? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm talking to you, Dina. Um, uh, you said the, 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 you attached importance to similarity of syntax and yes. structure in choosing a different programming language. Why? What's the importance of that? Ah, okay. Very good question. So. So um, I'll try to answer that briefly. So the first is that um, if you think about natural languages, right, natural languages, there are language families, they've grown up through cultural, you know, if you think about a cultural heritage point of view, um, they develop through history and so forth. Programming languages for the most part are, are developed for specific purposes. PHP was developed specifically to work on the web. Fortran was developed with many digits of um, significance for scientific calculations at the time and so forth. So um, we first of all want to think about a programming language that would be appropriate. But then within that, for example, in this case, either Python using CGI, which allows you to build web pages, Python could have handled either of these. No problem. I mean, maybe there would be a problem, I don't know. Um, but certainly we tested what Python would look like and you wouldn't be able to see. But in order to use code resituation, in order to literally copy and paste as much of the original code as possible into the new environment and minimize the external library of functions that we use to kind of tweak the language, we wanted a language that is more similar in structure. So. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes, but what, but then, I'm sorry, but then of course the really interesting thing is just like parts of speech will differ among natural languages, floating point numbers are handled very differently in Java and JavaScript. So I didn't highlight, but those little green parts of the code, that's where we have an, ex, we have an external function that whenever there's a floating point number, we tell JavaScript exactly what to do so that the JavaScript calculations will mimic what Java would do with that number, because they're very different languages. Does that? Yes, Mark. Could these situations are really elegant way of handling this. But my question is about what happens when the technology that we're using today, the languages you are using today, are defunct, mm -hmm. and we can't play back on pieces of hardware. And are, what is the long-term preservation strategy for taking your <coughs> resituated code and preserving that and layering it on top of the new code that you'd be writing and how long does that whole mirrors go on for? So I have a couple of thoughts about that. One of them is we're buying time. I do feel that at some point in maybe the distant future, but hopefully not too distant, uh, emulation will get much better. Emulation right now might be fine for an ATM machine. I like to use ATM machines because I worked on ATM machines for one year and it was the most boring professional year of my life. But anyhow, um, but um, so I think that it's possible and there's a lot of good work happening with emulation. Um, the other thing that'll be very interesting in terms of migration is by using code resituation, we're we're trying to minimize the migration, really, because really all that's happening is we have this external library function. And we're using, we, the other thing is, we're using languages that aren't going anywhere anytime soon. So I don't know where it'll be 100 years from now. Um, certainly JavaScript isn't going anywhere anytime soon, neither is Python. But maybe by then they would emulate the 2018 restoration. I'm not sure. And it'll also depend on 
on how internet stuff is handled. I'm actually much more concerned about fidelity of color and how that how aspects of the work like color and also speed of animation didn't really apply here but uh, in some of the stuff that some of the pieces we've worked on you know we've literally looked at how the animation is programmed and then studied looked at the hardware and done the calculations to figure how we would simulate and and documented all of that um, I, I think it's the artistic behaviors because Let's put it this way: this, the um, the the sciences are not going to allow software to disappear. And there's a whole field called scientific reproducibility, which is, of course, money is raining on that field. Um, in because the idea is that if you're a scientist, you need to be able to do an experiment, and then you need to be able to repeat that experiment and get the same results in five years, a hundred years, five hundred years. And I know I'm grossly oversimplifying, so I apologize. But the point is that if your experiment, in fact, in science depends on computational techniques and computational methods, then 500 years from now, somebody needs to be able to reproduce your experiment. Um, I've met with some mathematicians in my uh, institute who do work in this area, and they say, we have a much harder problem <laughs> um, because we've got to do everything that they do, plus we need to, you know, it's the, you, however you want to, you know, the experience of the artwork, the fidelity to color and things like that to think about. So I do think that the software will, will be able to keep the software. I'm just not sure exactly how. Yes? Um, we're moving towards the future. Most of us who do any coding essentially basically go to places like Stack Overflow and take pre-existing code. Not my time, not my students. And then stitch it together. <laughs> <laughs> so it's plagiarism because you're actually taking somebody else's code and then repurposing it. To what extent, it, so therefore if you're looking at these and trying to recreate the code, does it really matter at the same point? And, and to what extent can you forensically analyze the code and see actually this is a, a piece which has been taken from elsewhere and repurposed? So are you, are you saying that the artist or the artist programmer is the one who went to Stack Overflow and got the repurposed well, code? So, so, I mean, if you're doing it today, in a sense, because you want to use the code for a purpose, but it doesn't, if, someone, if someone's pre-coded that for you, then you can essentially take that piece of code and then repurpose it for your use and you modify it a bit. But the point being that you then have a history of where the code has come from rather than coding it directly, natively from source. Um, I can only say that of all the artists I've interviewed, um, it's never come up that they got code from somewhere else. There may have been collaborators. Um, and certainly... Um, are, there are some artists who provide their code and invite other people to work with it. There are also artists who um, I forget their names right now, but the, who did I want you to I want you to want me at MoMA, um, who provided the data as open source and so that people would would you know work with their data. Um, but I would say that, um, and I'm not quite sure how to say this the right way, but. Um, a well-trained programmer who feels fluent in the language, actually, it's much faster to write it yourself than to look it up. So I, I ha I, I've run into, we've run into situations with collaboration. Um, that's why I brought up the software libraries. If you can't, if you don't have the physics library or the sound library that you need, you won't be able to recompile a piece, for example, um, or update it. Um, but that's, you know, so the, and there the sources are known. Um, I think it may have to do with the methodologies, but that's, yeah. Certainly, I, as I say, I don't, I hope my students aren't doing that. <laughs> so they get points off if they do. On that note, actually, it's time for us to break for coffee, but we'll absolutely come back in the panel. <laughs>